Hello everyone, welcome back to Debunking Christian Apologetics. I'm your host, Zabora. Today we're going to be going over Josephus and his works on Jesus. Now, in our last video, we covered Pliny the Younger and Tacitus. Tacitus? Man, fuck Roman names. <laughs> uh, and today we're going to be doing Josephus. So, Josephus is a very important guy. Uh, he's almost contemporary with the time of Christ. He's most certainly contemporary with Mark and the destruction of the Second Jewish Temple. Um, he's the one that actually wrote history of the Jewish wars in the seven books under uh, Vespian's reign. And for those of you who have seen my debunking of Atwell's work, will know who Vespian is. Now, um, the original Aramaic has been lost, but the Greek, which we do have, uh, was prepared under Josephus's personal direction, so it is an authentic source. We can trust it. Uh, now, there's two passages supposedly by Josephus himself. One is a blatant forgery, in my opinion. The other is largely authentic with a very small interpolation by Christians um, that was done at a later date. Let's see if you can spot it. Okay, so this is chapter 9, uh, book 20, chapter 9, concerning Albinus, under whose proctorship James was slain, as also what edifice were built by Agrippa. We're not really going to talk about Agrippa. That's not really important. Um, okay, so... And now Caesar, upon hearing the death of Festus, sent Albinus into Judea as procurator. But the king deprived Joseph of the high priesthood, and bestowed the succession to that dignity on the son of Ananias, who was also himself called Ananias. Now the report goes that this eldest Ananias proved a most fortunate man, for he had five sons who had all performed the office of a high priest to God, and who had himself enjoyed that dignity a long time formerly, which had never happened to any other of our high priests. But this younger Ananias, who as we have you already, who we have told of you already, excuse me, took the high priesthood, was a bold who took the high priesthood, was a bold man in his temper and very insolent. He was also of the sect of the Sad Sadducees. Uh, who are very rigid in judging offenders above all the rest of the Jews, as we have already observed. When, therefore, Ananias was of this disposition, he thought he had now a proper opportunity to exercise his authority. Festus, who is now dead, and Albinus was but upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges, and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called the Christ, whose names was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. But as for those who seemed the most equitable of the citizens, and such as were the most uneasy at the breach of the laws, they disliked what, the, they disliked what was done. They also sent the, to the king Agrippa, desiring him to send to Ananias that he should act so no more for that what he had already done was not to be justified nay some of them went also to meet albinus as he was upon his journey from alexandria and informed him that it was not lawful for ananias to assemble a sanhedrin without his consent whereupon albinus compiled what he they compiled with what they said and wrote in anger to Ananias and threatened that he would bring him to punishment for what he had done, on which King Agrippa took the high priesthood from him when he had ruled but three months and made Jesus the son of Damnius high priest. Did you spot the interpolation? That little bit of extra inserted into the story? The passage, the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James. Did you spot it yet? All right, let me break it down. If we follow the story correctly, James is dead. Jesus is alive and now is high priest because of some bullshit made up to him by the new sheriff in town. He is the law around there. So tell me, now, how the fuck does this jive with Paul, who says that he met James, the brother of the Lord, when, uh... He talked to him after Jesus supposedly was crucified. I mean, I know how to reconcile it. Brother of the Lord just means baptized Christians. So the James that Paul met would just 
be some asshole. He wouldn't be the fleshly brother of the Christ. Uh, sorry, apologetics. You, you can't have it both ways. Either James, the one that Paul met, was Jesus' brother, or he was just a baptized Christian who was in on the whole thing. Um, so here's another kicker. Did you hear that last line? Jesus, son of Damnius, not Ben Yusuf, Ben Damnius. Uh, this Jesus is just a guy who got the priesthood because his brother was murdered by the chief of police. That's it. That's the whole thing. Jesus and James and a couple of James's buddies, they were all rounded up. James and the buddies were killed by uh, this asshole Ananias the Younger. And they're like, look, you can't be high priest anymore. You fucked up. I don't, he, I don't know what you did. It doesn't really matter. But this is what you did for whatever reasons you did them. James is the one who's killed, not Jesus. Jesus gets the high priesthood and somehow is also the same Jesus that gets assassinated and Paul meets his brother James. Um, but yeah, you, you just you don't get it both ways. So, like I said... This is largely just a true story about a guy, normal guy, not magical in any way, who gets the priesthood because his brother is killed by the chief of police. That's it. This little interpolation, this little, little bit of extra, who was called the Christ, is the insert that was done by later Christians in order to say that Josephus wrote about Jesus because Josephus, as I said, would be considered somewhat contemporary with the time of Christ and this destruction of the second Jewish temple. Now, Josephus was, of course, not a Christian, so um, this next passage that we're going to cover, the Testimonium Flavium, this is, like, entirely made up either by Eusebius or Eusebius' student because it has uh, a very Eusebian-esque kind of quality to it. And um, the reason why we believe that, uh, or the reason why experts, I should say, literary experts say that this is a forgery and not Josephus's writing is because it doesn't match his style. Now, lay people will, of course, go, well, I could just change my writing style. But you really can't. There are experts in the field that say, you know, that's not an actual thing. You'll always kind of fall into certain little idiosyncrasies and stuff like that, that it's, that's unique to you. So it's, it's really not a, a smart thing or an informed thing, I should say. It's not an informed thing to say that, well, Josephus could have just changed the way he wrote because you just, you just can't do that. <laughs> That's according to the experts, okay? Um, so not only that, but um, this, this piece of literature has been debunked over and over again since like the 1500s, and I'll go over the evidence for that, but even Origen himself scoured Josephus's writings for Jesus and never found any and uh, origin would have been in like uh would have been writing in the, like the 200s or so um so yeah it's just it's complete bullcrap but i figured we're going to cover it because it's definitely something that is asserted by those christian apologetics um and people that are just ill-informed and have not actually checked the sources. So, uh, yeah, here we go. Of all the source material pertinent to the question of the historicity of Jesus, none is more controversial or widely discussed than the Testimonium Flavium, or TF. This 88-word account of Jesus found is found in Book 18 of Flavius Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews. Now, as I said before, we believe this is a forgery, but let's go ahead and cover the text, okay? And there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if indeed it is necessary to call him a man, for he was a doer of paradoxal works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure with pleasure and many jews on the one hand and also many of the greeks on the other he drew to himself he was the messiah and when on the accusation of some of the principal men among us pilate had condemned him to a cross those who had first loved him did not cease to do so for he appeared to them on the third day living again the divine prophets having related both these things and countless other marvels about him 
and even till now the tribe of Christians so named from this man has not gone extinct. There are several elements in this passage which do not ring true as something a devout Jew and a non-Christian like Josephus uh, would say. And uh, just a little side note here. Josephus's name in the Hebrew would have been Yusuf, Yusuf ben Mataihu. Mataihu. Yusuf ben Mataihu which is transliterated to Matthias and, of course, Matthew. So he would have been Joseph, son of Matthew. Okay? Just a little side note. I thought it was fun. <clears throat> now, after all, it doesn't make sense for a Jew like Josephus to declare that Jesus was the Messiah or attest he appeared to them on the third day living again. Um, as early as 1592, the Protestant scholar Lucas uh, Osiander who lived from 1534 to 1604, doubted the authenticity of this passage on exactly these grounds. Noting, if Josephus had felt he was asserted in that testimony, he would have been a Christian. However, not if, nothing with even a whiff of Christianity can be found in his writings. This is from his Etipomus Historiae Ecclesiastiae Centriae Decimia Sexte 1 Book 2 Chapter 1.17. Don't worry, I'm putting that on the screen. <laughs> Go for it, cousin. This is where we're going to need the edits. <laughs> now, later scholars took up this argument and noted other perceived problems with the passage. Louis Kappel, from, who lived from 1568 to 1658, pointed out that the passage does not seem to fit well within to, uh, in its surrounding narrative, and Tranquilus Faber from 1615 to 1672, <clears throat> noted that the passage contradicts Origen's repeated assertion that Josephus did not believe in Jesus as the Christ. And you can find that in Contra Celsus I.47, Commentaris in Matthew X.17. As the centuries passed, the number of defenders of the authenticity of the passage dwindled, and by the end of the 19th century, Benedict Nice, who lived in 1849 to 1910, placed it in the brackets in his 1890 critical edition of Josephus, indicating it as a probable interpolation. But then it was an, but by then it was just considered a wholesale inauthenticity uh, that was widely accepted. Now, this situation changed in uh, the 20th century. Both Christians and non-Christians were trying to re-examine everything and, and do better scholarship and stuff like that. Um, so, there is, of course, uh, more people who have cited this as an authentic, um, who say it's just a wholesale, just completely made up. Others believe some of it may be true. Others believe... Uh, 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 some believe that it could be Eusebius because um, when Origen had the testimony of Flavium, or excuse me, when Origen had the antiquities of the Jews, the testimony of Flavium was not there. Neither was the Christ. Um, but when Eusebius had it, after Origen, there was someone in the middle. Uh, it was Eusebius's teacher. Eusebius is the one who supposedly found these, but Origen scoured the work and never found them. So, between Origen and Eusebius, some asshole inserted this passage, or possibly both passages, into the um, historicity, uh, or excuse me, the antiquity of the Jews. So, um, yeah, we're going to go ahead and examine the passages of um, Luke now to kind of show how the testimony of Flavium was obviously a ripoff of Luke. And uh, the way that they did this was actually using a, like a supercomputer. This supercomputer actually has uh, the Greek and Latin literature as well as the Sosaurus Lingua Graecia, the TLG that was published by the University of California at Irvine. Um, it's a complete understanding of Greek writing and Latin writing up to, at the time of this publication in 1995, 
um, up to 73 million words. So what they did is they inserted or they looked up the first passage of Josephus or the Testimonium Flavium. Um, there happened about this time Jesus, a wise man, if a one can call him a man, for he was um, of amazing deeds, uh, a worker. And they inserted that uh, into the text, looking in to see if there's any anything that pops up with any similarity. And what popped up was the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verse 19. The thing about Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet mighty indeed. So, if you look at the two passages, the word Jesus indeed is the only thing that pops up. But, because of the original Greek, the way it's actually written, the word man also appears. So, there happened about this time Jesus, wise man, if a man one may call him indeed, for he was of amazing deeds a worker. So the word Jesus, man, and deeds were plugged in. They came up in this passage, Iasus hos eginto anir prophetis, which literally translate as Jesus, who was a man prophet, great of deeds. Um, so the word man, prophet, Jesus, and deeds all popped up in the computer search. And that's just because, again, the way that the fucking Greek is written. Apologies. I forgot to say what I was citing. Um, this is the coincidence of the Emmaus narrative of Luke and the testimonium of Josephus by Gary J. Goldberg. Um, this was published in the Journal for the Study of Pseudopigraphy. 13 in 1995 page 59 through 77 he's the one that used the supercomputer to uh, test um, to see if he could find any similarities between uh, Josephus's to testimonium flavium and the um, I gotta stop saying Josephus's testimonium flavium it's Eusebius's fucking testimonium flavium <laughs> Uh, but he's the one that plugged it in and actually found the connections here to uh, Luke 24. There's also similar things in 1 Corinthians 15 through through 8. Um, as well as Acts chapter 2, 22 through 36. Acts 3, 13 through 16. Acts 5, 30 through 32. Acts 13, 23 through 41. And uh, uh, Goldberg goes on to cite um, 20, uh, consi 20 things that are in the Flavium Testimonium, the Testimonium Flavium, as well as the Gospel of Luke and these other sources, these other uh, Bible passages that I listed. 20 of them in order. Um, well, except for one. There's one that's a little out of order, but 19 out of 20 plus the 20th one being there, it's just in a different place. It, it just seems to me that this is an obvious forgery using Luke. So in conclusion, I believe that the Testimonium Flavium is an entire um, BS story that was ripped off from Luke for the reasons I've cited in the video. Um, I also believe that it was Eusebius or Eusebius's predecessor, his teacher, Pantheus, who was in charge of the library after Origen. Um, as I said, Origen had the antiquity of the Jews and then Pantheus had it and then Pantheus's student Eusebius had it. So either Pantheus invented it or Eusebius invented it and claimed he, he found it. Uh, it's one of the two. It, it just, it sounds kind of Eusebian, um, but it could be Pantheus as well because he would have been Eusebius's teacher. So, uh, yeah, I hope this has been enlightening. Um, Richard Carrier, of course, believes, if I'm reading his work correctly, that both are fakes and both are inserted by Eusebius. Um, I'm not entirely clear if he believes the entire passage of Jesus Ben Damnius is a forgery or not. Um, I don't think it is because it's really just unremarkable. It's about a man whose brother's killed by the police and then he runs the gang. So I don't think that that would be something worth um, forging. However, I'm not entirely sure how 
the book is put together. I don't know if something's just like penciled into the margins or if the entire thing is written out in perfect Greek or, or what. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's it for tonight, guys. Um, I guess stop using Josephus as proof of the historicity of Jesus and stop using Josephus as proof of Jesus's godhood. That's it for tonight, guys. Bye-bye.